This is the last lecture, which was in fact, uh, so it'll be lecture 11, uh, chronologically lecture 81, which was in fact the last lecture that Rudolf Steiner ever gave in his life. It is called The Last Address. It is a partial lecture. He was not able to finish it. And uh, it was given on Michaelmas Eve of 1924. And there's a preface by Alfred Heidenreich, one of the first priests of the Christian community. And I'm going to read that preface to the last address and then the last address together. If you wish to skip the preface, go to the 14 minute and 35 second mark. Autumn in Dornach can be incomparably beautiful. Even springtime, when all the cherry trees around the Gertianum are in blossom, cannot match it. In autumn the gardens abound with flowers in every possible color and shape. The clear air blows down from the Alps. They cannot be seen, but their presence is felt in the background. The autumn sun fills the valleys with a steady warm glow. In the stillness of the night the stars glitter overhead and seem to send messages to those who can hear them, and the whole atmosphere is filled with a sense of ripeness, fulfillment and fruitfulness. It was in such a setting that Rudolf Steiner achieved the fantastic culmination of his 25 years of anthroposophical work. As will be generally known, he gave the results of his studies and investigations mainly in lectures. The, short, the shorthand records of nearly 6,000 of them have been preserved. The living contact from spirit to spirit through the spoken word proved to be the best means of getting over those astonishing discoveries in the spirit world, which he had made in long years of earnest and innermost research. Of course, the books which he wrote and prepared for publication, with their concentrated, limpid, crystal-clear style, are indispensable for the study of anthroposophy. But in his lectures, the very pulse of his own spiritual life could be felt, and in some measure can still be recaptured in the published notes and transcripts. In the last autumn of his life, during the month of September 1924, Rudolf Steiner surpassed in sheer concentrated quantity anything he had ever done before. Of the quality of these last gifts it is difficult to speak. Ordinary words do not measure up to it. He gave four lectures every day sometimes even five during those September weeks. In the evening he spoke to members of the Anthroposophical Society on the delicate subject of reincarnation and karma. A supreme master of the subject, he understood how to lift in some measure the veil from the age-old spiritual historic background of the Anthroposophical movement. Or he would assemble the members of the esoteric school for a special class. In the mornings and afternoons, three courses continued from day to day. A series of eighteen lectures on the Book of Revelation was given to the priests of the Christian community. A series of lectures on pastoral medicine to anthroposophical doctors and the priests together a series of nineteen lectures on dramatic art to the students of speech and drama at the Gertianum. In this last course he sometimes took whole scenes from plays and acted them himself, impersonating one character after another. On two days of the week he also continued his regular lectures for the workmen at the Gertianum. As one who was privileged to take part in all these courses and lectures, except those for the workmen, I would testify to the truly extraordinary combination of sober matter-of-factness and spiritual elation which prevailed in these meetings. The floodgates of revelation were opened as they had not been for uncounted times, and yet it was all taken as part of normal human life. 
In the evening of February 27, September, we made our way, as usual, up the hill to the Schreinerei, the large carpenter's workshop where most of the wooden structure for the first Gertianum had been prepared, and where a temporary lecture hall had been improvised after the first Gertianum had been destroyed by fire and while the second Gertianum was being built. For the first time in Rudolf Steiner's life a brief notice was put up to say that he was unable to give his lecture that night because he was not well enough to do so. Reports and rumors concerning his health had been current for some time. Spiritual development and transformation of the kind Rudolf Steiner achieved draws on the natural vitality of the body in a manner in which a lighted candle consumes its substance as a sacrificial flame. As a result, the digestive system grows extremely sensitive. It was said that with Rudolf Steiner, this had reached such a degree that at times ordinary food would affect him like poison. It was also said that with the burning of the first Gertianum, part of his very own life had gone away with the flames. Indeed, one could not fail to notice with growing anxiety that at times he looked exhausted. On the previous day, 26th September, I had been allowed to call on him briefly on a private matter and was deeply distressed to see him as I had never seen him before. I hardly dared to speak. I was thoroughly ashamed of myself for having bothered him, although the few minutes of conversation were invaluable for the rest of my life. Yet at the same time, during his lectures he always seemed to recover. He might move to the rostrum with effort, but after an hour and a half he walked away with the buoyancy of a young man. At these moments and during other times he refreshed himself from the sources from which the spiritual vitality of the cosmos is maintained. On the following night, 28th September, the eve of St. Michael's Day, Michael's Day, Rudolf Steiner raffte sich auf and with superhuman strength once more gathered all his energy together to give a lecture in honor of the festival of St. Michael. It had been a focusing point in his lectures during that summer to reveal the archangel Michael as the spirit of the age, the inspiring and guiding guardian of the present period of history. He had described him as the, quote, fiery prince of thought, close quote, with whom the souls had been connected who are drawn into the anthroposophical movement, and by whom they had been prepared and taught in a Michael school, in the spirit world, before they descended into incarnation in this century. The present, in quotes, last address, is a transcript of what Rudolf Steiner said on that evening. It is a delicate, precious legacy. Technically, it is a fragment. Rudolf Steiner requested that the transcript should not be made available before he had given the second half, but he was never able to complete the lecture. And thus, it was eventually published as it stands, an earnest token, perhaps, of the fact that his very life, all too brief for his disciples and students, in spite of the incredible wealth of his creative gifts, was cut short by the stonewalling of an uninspired, intellectually self-satisfied and basically dull age. As it stands, the last address presents a serious problem of thought to anthroposophists. Never before had Rudolf Steiner linked together the individualities of John the Baptist and Lazarus John in the manner in which he did it in this last lecture. Of the individuality of John the Baptist he had spoken many times before. The spirit who lived in the Baptist was in fact treated by Rudolf Steiner as the paradigm of a representative sequence of consecutive lives of the same individuality, Elijah, John the Baptist, Raphael, Novalis, 
This was the first series of reincarnations, declared by Steiner early on in his teaching, and never added to by any other examples, until the very last months of his life. In their various ways, these four historic personalities were the lives of the herald angel of Christ. The dramatic raising of Lazarus from the grave was an event which led to the elucidation of a different mystery. In his book titled Christianity as Mystical Fact, published in 1902, Rudolf Steiner described this apparent, in quotes, miracle as an act of initiation. In this act, which represents a transitional form between the rituals of initiation in the mystery temples of the ancient world and the dawning Christian era in which initiations of this type were, are superseded altogether by inner developments, Lazarus became Lazarus John, quote, the disciple whom Jesus loved, close quote, and the author of the fourth gospel. Although Rudolf Steiner spoke in the years after 1902 of this event and of the figure who passed through it, many times and from many different sides he never referred to another incarnation of Lazarus except on an intimate occasion, the content of which became known somewhat more generally only much later after his death. But as already stated, he never connected John the Baptist and Lazarus John in the manner suggested in the last address, and a previous incarnation of Lazarus which he indicated on the occasion mentioned above would seem to point in a different direction. Thus we are really left with the mystery. Fortunately, some light has been thrown on this through a reply which Rudolf Steiner is reported to have given to a question by Dr. Ludwig Noll, the physician who, together with Dr. Ita Wegmann, the head of the medical section of the Gertianum, attended him during his illness. We quote the postscript printed in the most recent German edition of the last address. Quote, According to authenticated statements, the following verbal explanation was given by Rudolf Steiner to his physician, Dr. Ludwig Noll, in connection with the last address. And this is now Steiner's quote. At the awakening of Lazarus, the spiritual being, John the Baptist, who since his death had been the overshadowing spirit of the disciples, penetrated from above into Lazarus as far as the consciousness soul. The being of Lazarus himself, from below, intermingled with the spiritual being of John the Baptist from above. After the awakening of Lazarus, this being is Lazarus John, the disciple whom the Lord loved. And that's close quote. This is a great help, but the present writer feels that even this illuminating comment still leaves some profound problems unanswered, and other readers and students of the last address may well share this feeling. The real core of the mystery seems to lie in the question, did the two individualities, the Baptist and the disciple whom Jesus loved, share their future incarnations? And if so, in what form? Perhaps this is where we must leave the matter. In some other context, Rudolf Steiner remarked with quiet, quiet seriousness that it is in certain respects better and more fruitful for the development of a human soul on its path to the spirit if the soul has to ponder a spiritual problem rather than be furnished with a plain and neat answer. Did Rudolf Steiner leave the esoteric riddle of the last address with us so that we might grow by pondering it reverently and thus be led eventually to revelations which we should find ourselves? And that's the end of the preface by Alfred Heidenreich. And now... Lecture 11, The Last Address of Rudolf Steiner My dear friends, it has not been possible for me to speak to you on the last two days, but today, the day when the Michael mood of dedication must pour its light into all our heart and souls 
in readiness for the morrow. This day, my dear friends, I did not want to let pass without speaking to you at least a few words. That I am able to do so is due entirely to the loving and devoted care of our friend Dr. Ita Vaitman. And so I hope that I will still be able to say today what I desire particularly to say to you on the occasion of this festival. In recent months we have frequently spoken, my dear friends, of the instreaming of the Michael power into the spiritual events of man's life on earth. And it will be one of the more beautiful results that can follow from our anthroposophical understanding of times and seasons if we are really able to add to the other festivals of the year a rightly ordered Michael festival. That, however, will only be possible when the might and power of the Michael thought, of which today men have no more than a dim feeling, has taken hold in a number of human souls, who will then be able to create the right human starting point for such a festival. What we can do at present is to awaken, in this Michael time, the Michael mood in our souls, by giving ourselves up to thoughts that will prepare the way for a future Michael festival. And such thoughts are especially stirred to activity within us when we turn our gaze upon all that we have seen taking place, partly on earth, partly in supersensible worlds, through long periods of time, in preparation for all that can now be accomplished for human evolution in the course of this present century by souls who in full sincerity feel themselves drawn to the Michael stream. That you yourselves, my dear friends, in so far as you truly and honestly incline to the anthroposophical movement, belong to these souls. This I have endeavored to make clear to you in the lectures of the last weeks, and especially also in the lectures where I spoke to you directly of the karma of the Anthroposophical Society. We can, however, carry these considerations a little further, and that is what I want to do today. Let us now bring before our souls beings who are intimately connected and will always be intimately connected with the Michael stream, in the sense in which we have described it here. Let us direct our gaze to beings who in at least two successive incarnations made a powerful impression on great numbers of their fellow men, beings who, however, only show themselves in their true unity when we recognize them as successive incarnations of one and the same being. When we look back into olden times, we see rise up before us, within the traditions of Judaism, the prophetic figure of Elijah. We know what significance the prophet Elijah had for the people of the Old Testament, and therewith for all mankind. We know how he set before them the goal and destiny of their existence. And we have shown how, in the course of time, the being who was present in Elijah appeared again at the very most important moment of human evolution, appeared again so that Christ Jesus himself could give him the initiation he was to receive for the evolution of mankind. For the being of Elijah appeared again in Lazarus John, who are in truth one and the same figure, as you will have understood from my book, Title Christianity is Mystical Fact. And further, we saw that this being appears once more in that world painter who let his artistic power unfold in marvelous depths of tenderness as it moved, hovering over the mystery of Golgotha. And we saw how the deeply Christian impulse that lived in Raphael as it were impelling into color and form the very nature and being of Christianity itself. We saw how this impulse rose again in the poet Novalis. In the poet Novalis stands revealed in wondrously beautiful words what Raphael had placed before mankind in colors and forms of rarest loveliness. 
We see thus, following one another in time, beings who are brought together into a unity when incarnation is understood. We know, for I have often spoken with you of these things, how when man has gone through the gate of death, he enters the world of stars. What we are accustomed to call stars, in quotes, in the external physical sense, are no more than the outer sign and symbol of spiritual worlds which look down upon us and take their share and part in all the deeds of the evolution of mankind. We know that man passes through the moon sphere and through the spheres of Mercury and Venus, through the spheres of the Sun and of Mars and of Jupiter and Saturn. And we know that when, together with the beings of these spheres, and together too with other human souls who have also departed from the life on earth, he has elaborated his karma, he then turns back again to earthly existence. Bearing this in mind, let us look for a moment at Raphael and see how he passes through the gate of death and how he enters the realm of the starry worlds, the realm of spiritual evolution, taking with him the power of his art, which already on earth shone with the bright light of the stars. We behold, my dear friends, how Raphael enters the moon sphere, and we see how he comes into association here with the spirits who live in the moon sphere and who are the spiritual individualities of the great original leaders of mankind, with whose wisdom Raphael, as Elijah, had been deeply inspired. He meets these moon beings, and he meets too all the souls with whom he has lived in earlier stages of earth evolution. We see how he unites himself spiritually with the spiritual origin of the earth, with that world of being which first made it possible for man to be, and for the earthly to be impregnated with the divine. We behold Raphael, as it were, completely, in quotes, at home, united with those with whom he had most loved to be in the Elijah existence, inasmuch as it was they who at the beginning of earth existence set the goal for the life of this earth. Then we behold him wandering through the Mercury sphere, where in association with the great cosmic healers he transforms for his spirituality the power that had been his to create what is so infinitely whole and healthy in color and line. All that he has painted, whether on canvas or as a fresco on the wall, for the help and comfort as well as for the unending inspiration of such as can understand, all his work that was so radiant with light showed itself now to him in the great cosmic connection in which it is able to stand when it passes through the beings of the Mercury sphere. And thus was he who on earth had unfolded so great a love for art, whose soul had been aflame with love for color and for line, transplanted now into the sphere of Venus, which in turn lovingly bore him across to the sun, to that sun existence which lived in all his incarnations so far as they are yet known to us. For it was from the sun that he, as the prophet Elijah, brought to mankind, through the medium of his own people, the truths that belong to the goals of existence. We see how in the sun sphere he is able to live through over again in a deep and intimate sense, in another way now than when he was on earth as a companion of Christ Jesus. He is able to live over again what he underwent when, through the initiation of Christ Jesus, he, Lazarus, became John. And all that he has painted in shining light for the followers of Christ Jesus, he now beholds all this poor, its rays into the cosmic transformation of the human heart. You read that again. 
and all that he has painted in shining light for the followers of Christ Jesus, he now beholds all this pour its rays into the cosmic transformation of the human heart. And we see further how what he thus had at the foundation of his life penetrates, wisdom-filled, the sphere of Jupiter. In this sphere he is able in wisdom to enter into a relation of understanding with such spirits as Goethe, the spirit, that is, that afterward became Goethe, as well as also with spirits who had gone astray on other paths, but who, nevertheless, led over world-being and world-thought into the realm of the magical. The foundation is laid for his magical idealism in the experience he had of the evolution of the later Eliphas Levi, and we behold, too, how he partakes in all that was living there in Swedenborg. And now I must draw your attention to something in the life of Raphael that is of very great significance. A personality who was most deeply devoted to Raphael, Hermann Grimm, set to work four times to write a life of Raphael. His title, Life of Michelangelo, he brought to a beautiful completeness. But he never succeeded in drawing any picture of Raphael's earthly life that gave him satisfaction. In his own view, all he wrote was unfinished and incomplete. The first book he undertook was intended to be a biography. What is it? Nothing but a reproduction of old anecdotes <clears throat> anecdotes told by Vasari. No biography of Raphael at all, but something altogether different, a description of what Raphael became on earth after his death in the respect and recognition of his fellow men. Hermann Grimm relates what people have thought of Raphael, what the Italians, the French, the Germans have thought of Raphael in the course of history through the centuries. What he gives us is a biography of the Raphael thought as it has lived here on earth since his death. He finds the way to tell what remains of Raphael in the hearts and minds of men what lives of him still in their reverence and understanding. But he does not find the possibility to give a picture of the earthly life of Raphael. After Hermann Grimm has made the attempt four times over, he says, all that one can really do for Raphael as a personality is to write of how one picture passes over into the next, as though it had been painted by a supersensible being who had simply not touched the earth at all with his earthly life. The pictures are there, and one can look right away from Raphael, who painted the pictures, and reproduce the sequence of what is expressed in their inner content. And so, shortly before his death, Hermann Grimm made, began to speak once again about Raphael. Yet once more he made the attempt to put pen to paper and write about him. This time, however, he spoke only of his pictures and not about the earthly personality of Raphael at all. The truth is, my dear friends, this earthly personality of Raphael was completely yielded up and was only present through what Lazarus John gave to this soul to be poured out into color and line for all mankind. Such was the life of this being. And it was so that this Raphael life could only be, as it were, absolved in another life of thirty years, in Novalis. And so we see Raphael die young, Novalis die young, one being, who came forth from Elijah John, appearing before mankind in two different forms, preparing through art and through poetry the true Michael mood of soul, sent down by the Michael stream as messenger to men on earth. And now we behold the wonderful artistic power of Raphael come to life again in Novalis in poetry that stirs and enraptures the hearts of men. All that through Raphael was given to human eyes to see, of this 
could human hearts drink deep when it came again in Novalis. When we consider the life of Novalis, what an echo we find there of the Raphael life for which Hermann Grimm had so fine an understanding. His beloved dies in her youth, he himself still young. What is he going to do with his life now that she has died? He tells us himself. He says that his life on earth will be henceforth to, quote, die after her, close quote, to follow her on the way of death. He wants to pass over already now into the supersensible, to lead again the Raphael life, not touching the earth, but living out in poetry his magic idealism. He would fain not let himself be touched by earth life. When we read the title Fragments of Novalis and give ourselves up to the life that flows so abundantly in them, we can discover the secret of the deep impression they make on us. Whatever we have before us in immediate sense reality, whatever the eye, E-Y-E, can see and recognize as beautiful, all this, through the magic idealism that lives in the soul of Novalis, appears in his poetry with a well-nigh heavenly splendor. The meanest and simplest material thing, with the magic idealism of his poetry, he can make it live again in all its spiritual light and glory. And so we see in Novalis a radiant and splendid forerunner of that Michael stream, which is now to lead you all, my dear friends, while you live. And then, after you have gone through the gate of death, you will find in the spiritual, supersensible worlds all those others, among them also the being of whom I have been speaking to you today, all those with whom you are to prepare the work that shall be accomplished at the end of the century, and that shall lead mankind past the great crisis in which it is involved. This work is to let the Michael power and the Michael will penetrate the whole of life. The Michael power and the Michael will are none other than the Christ will and the Christ power going before in order to implant in the right way into the earth the power of the Christ. If this Michael power is able verily to overcome all that is of the demon and the dragon, and you well know what that is, if you all who have in this way received in the light the Michael thought, have indeed received it with true and faithful heart and with tender love, and will endeavor to go forward from the Michael mood of this year, until not only is the Michael thought revealed in your soul, but you are also but you are able also to make the Michael thought live in your deeds in all its strength and all its power. If this is so, then will you be true servants of the Michael thought worthy helpers of what has now to enter earth evolution through anthroposophy and take its place there in the meaning of Michael. If, in the near future, in four times twelve human beings, the Michael thought becomes fully alive, four times twelve human beings, that is, who are recognized not by themselves, but by the leadership of the Gertianum and Dorna. If in four times twelve such human beings, leaders arise having the mood of soul that belongs to the Michael festival, then we can look up to the light that through the Michael stream and the Michael activity will be shed abroad in the future among mankind. Because this is so, my dear friends, I have made the effort today to rise up and speak to you, if only in these few short words. My strength is not sufficient for more today. May the words so speak to your soul that you receive the Michael thought in the sense of what a faithful follower of Michael may feel. When clothed in the light rays of the sun, Michael appears 
and points us to that which must now take place. For it must even be so that this Michael garment, this garment of light, shall become the words of the worlds, which are the Christ words, the words of the worlds, which can transform the Logos of the worlds into the Logos of mankind. Therefore, let my words to you today be these. Springing from powers of the sun, radiant spirit powers, blessing all worlds. For Michael's garment of rays, ye are predestined by thought divine. He, the Christ messenger, revealeth in you, bearing mankind aloft, the sacred will of worlds. Ye, the radiant beings of ether worlds, bear the Christ word to man. Thus shall the herald of Christ appear to the thirstily waiting souls, to whom your word of light shines forth in cosmic age of spirit man. Ye, the disciples of spirit knowledge, Take Michael's wisdom beckoning, take the word of love of the will of worlds into your souls aspiring actively.